Okay, hello everyone. Um, thanks for coming to the uh, Lunch and Learn series, um, primarily you know, sponsored by NCOSI and the Three River Chapters. And I appreciate some of my colleagues being willing to uh, give these talks. And I'm um, Phil Bianca, I'm the Vice President of the Three Rivers Chapter. And I organize these, you know, again, the, these talks. And so today, you know, you're here for the model-based system is engineering, MBSE, and architectural perspective. And it's really interesting what these guys do and when I introduce them, Okay, and just advertising the next session. So our next session is going to be Wednesday, November 16th, and it's the facing the challenges of artificial intelligence, building the discipline of AI, and that's going to be conducted by Dr. John Lee. He's uh, a member of the technical staff, senior member of the technical staff at the SEI, and um, he'll share share um, his his knowledge with us uh, next month. And without further ado, um, you know I want to introduce this, and I find this. You know, fascinating as a system architect, because what I love about model-based system engineering is, you know, these guys like Dio, Sam, and Jerome, they do a lot of the hard work for me. So they'll create these wonderful safety models and scheduling models. And I only need to understand my architecture, the properties that are important to feed into that model, and how to interpret the results. And they work really hard on the back end you know, ensuring that those models, you know, are correct and they're verified and they produce great results and simplifies my life a lot because before I push forward and build things or invest in, you know, more expensive um, methods like prototyping and things like that, I can do this type of modeling that, that they do and the reasoning frameworks that they provide. Um, they answer a lot of architecturally significant questions for me. And so that's why I like that they have this architectural perspective because you don't want to model just for the sake of modeling, right? You want to model and you want to transform your architecture into those inputs and interpret those outputs to answer questions that are important to your stakeholders and important to the success of your system. Um, you know, not just what the system does, but kind of how, how well, and before you build it, this can give you a lot of insight into that. So I think, you know, that's why I'm really, really high on this work and really appreciate them being willing to uh, come here today. And so, you know, I've been working with Dio um, for many, many years, and he's always impressive uh, when he prevents. He's done amazing work with multi-core and cyber physical systems um, across the board. And, you know, I know Sam um, as well, been working with Sam um, for a few years, and he's the initiative lead of our model-based uh, engineering team. Uh, and, you know, he's just a great guy, always willing to help you, always willing to answer questions. And unfortunately, I don't know Jerome as well. He's um, newer to the SEI, but he's been involved with uh, AADL, the architecture analysis and design language, and a lot of the models and committees and things for many years. And we were very lucky that he joined the SEI in the last few years. Um, you know, he, 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 he's been, you know, a professor and been teaching for years and researching for years. And so we're very lucky to have these guys on board. And uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to them. I know that's why you're here. And uh, I appreciate your time. Thanks. Thanks, Vino. <clears throat> so let me just share my screen. Uh, I want to share this one. And of course, you want to see slides. Come on, PowerPoint. Here we go. So yes, thanks, Phil, for the uh, for the introduction. So today, what uh, we Sam, Dio, and I will provide is most, mostly an overview of um, a subset of our work. Um, you mentioned that indeed we worked for several years on ADL, and actually the SEI is is a leader of the, uh, I mean the technical leader on, of the development of ADL. So today we want to, to bring an architectural perspective on MBSC, and let me jump through this um, and. To set the context, let me start just by giving an overview of what we mean by model-based engineering at the SCI. So, of course, there's kind of a paradox. Uh, we are the Software Engineering Institute, but actually, as of today, we cannot do um, software in isolation. Software is part of system, and software is increasingly dominating safety and mission critical system development cost. Why? Mostly because system is everywhere, controlling every aspect of a system. Be it mechanical, chemical, or whatever, there is a little bit of software somewhere to control it. As we are building more complex system, what we are discovering, and it's not new, but it's still a fact, many of issues are discovered after the software is being developed, after it is tested in the actual system. And in this context, what my team is advocating for is for the early discovery of system level issues. 
that will impact the way the software is interacting with the system. And for that, what we have developed is some uh, virtual integration capabilities and way to perform incremental analytical assurance of a system. And the solution that we have developed around AEDL is actually technology based on this standard that we have matured into practice through a couple of pilot projects and industry initiatives. Behind that, and um, at the end, we'll provide some pointers to that. There are a couple of research prototyping platforms, technical reports, videos that can allow you to go uh, further in this technology. One of the message that we want to deliver today is that through a um, proper definition of what is the architecture of your system, you can go deep enough into the semantics of the system to understand how uh, this architecture will impact some of the good properties you're expecting um, about your system. What we do um, here at the SCI, so as you mentioned, Phil, uh, we are an FFRDC whose main customer is a DOD. And what we are building through, uh, through ADL, through this technology, is actually two things, two set of uh, elements. The first one is this AADL language, this architecture analysis and design language that is complemented with a process called AGVIP, this architecture-centric virtual integration process. This language is supported by a tool, OZATE, which is an open source ADL toolset. Why do we want to have both aspects, both a standard and a complementary tool chain? First off, we want to, to enable designers to concentrate on the best design of the, of the system that will hold up over time as the system is evolving. Therefore, we need a way to capture the critical aspects of the system. And we want to test, we want to validate or verify it without even having to write any piece of code so that ultimately this single model can be reused to assess hardware embedded software before the system is built. And eventually from this model, we want also to be able to generate portion of the corresponding uh, supporting software system. Concretely, what is AADL? Uh, the idea of AADL uh, that we'll develop is to allow you to design the entire system and see where integration problems may occur. You have to view AADL as a risk reduction technology. As you are defining your system, starting from system engineering processes, uh, requirement engineering, a couple of system and models, you may have an idea of the way your system should look like in terms of function decomposition, in terms of interactions. But very quickly, if you're interested in safety aspects or performance aspects of your system, you need something more precise so that you can reason your system. And this is exactly the objective of AADL. The objective is to be able to perform some virtual integration of software, hardware, and system elements so that you can reason on them by inspecting data flow, control flow, error propagation flows. You may get a better insight on what could be critical to assure your system. And this is exactly the topic of AADL. So AADL is a standard coming from the SAE International uh, Standardization Body. AADL is focusing on embedded software system and with three pillars. We want to be able to express the system, we want to be able to analyze it, and we want to be able to generate um, software fragments out of it. It is a modeling language, but coming from a software engineering perspective, it is first and foremost a strongly typed language with a well-defined semantics. And the sem semantics is critical to be able to reason on the model. And as we will uh, discuss uh, in the next couple of slides, it is used in, uh, for building critical systems in avionics, aerospace, medical, etc. And as you mentioned, Phil, before joining the SE, I actually I started working on ADL in 2005. And some of the contributions I've made to ADL are related to aerospace. And here, uh, working for the SEI, my team is uh, interested in pushing forward AADL for developing avionics platform in the context of some uh, DOD projects. But let's do a little bit backwards. And before jumping into AADL, let's review MBSC uh, definitions and the impact of architecture. So of course, um, the idea of this talk is to be broader than the Incozy uh, audience. Um, we all know, I guess, uh, in this talk, what uh, systems engineering is about, and a couple of resources that exist. Um, system engineering, first and foremost, is a transdisciplinary and integrative approach to enable the su successful realization, use, and retirement of systems. 
And for that, we'll apply systems and principles and concepts. And behind that, scientific, technological, and management methods. So this is a very broad definition. And where do you start from that? Well, there are a couple of uh, very good references, the INCOSI Systems Engineering Body of Knowledge, the NASA Systems Engineering Handbook. The two of them are used in many universities to teach uh, systems engineering. And in addition to that, you may find some standards like um, the ISO uh, 15288 that will provide some uh, processes to um, develop your system engineering um, approach. And behind that, ultimately, you have hundreds of pages and certification by INCOSI, like the ASAP or CSAP that many of my students took in the past. But the question is, concretely, what does it mean? And why should we care about uh, those topics? Coming from software engineering background, uh, what we have to realize when we have to, to build a software system is that systems engineering provide, um, provides the vocabulary and some method, some method so that you can engineer big systems. And it's not really a surprise uh, for many of us if you remember that actually systems engineering emerged from NASA who built some of the biggest projects uh, back in the 60s. And at the same time, uh, system engineering is there to manage big programs uh, with a lot of acquisition topics. Behind that, behind system engineering, there is this idea of system science, system thinking, and ultimately model-based system engineering. And a collection of vocabulary elements like models, systems, interfaces. And we have to apply those context, those concepts, so that we can address uh, complex challenges. So for software engineers, definitely there is a big plus to go into the system thinking uh, mindset. But conversely, why should systems engineers care about software? Actually, if you review, um, so, uh, this slide is a little bit outdated, but still uh, relevant for our uh, talk today. There has been a couple of significant incidents in the avionics domain uh, with, for instance, the, um, the Qantas Airbus A330 was forced to make an emergency landing after the autopilot misbehaved. Or more, much more recently, the Boeing, uh, the Boeing 737 MAX. And in both cases, what happened is that the software who was in charge of controlling some critical aspects of the system behavior misbehaved. In the case of the 737 MAX, the story is well known of um, an authority conflict between the pilot and the autopilot. It was kind of um, a similar issue for the Airbus A330. In the case of the Airbus A330, it was mostly a question of one of the com computer receiving the bad data at the wrong time. And because of this, Inco uh, inconsistent data being processed, the autopilot decided to engage into an emergency procedure. Those are critical uh, system injuring um, um, problems that we have to address because ultimately we want the system to be safe. But how can we assess the safety of the system where tiny details like a wrong message arriving at the wrong time will have a tremendous impact on um, on the system behavior, on the system safety. And so what our team uh, advocated for is really to this realization that embedded software systems introduce a world class of problems that are very difficult uh, to address by traditional system uh, safety analysis. And also issues that are very difficult to capture in a systems engineering uh, process. And for that, what we have to do is to go back to uh, the system definition and to its architecture. To give you an illustration, um, if we take um, a software system perspective for which we have uh, specific considerations like cybersecurity or uh, CPU or memory uh, budgets, safety of, um, of the software system or real-time performance, all of that is part of the definition of a typical software system. Just think of typical IT system that you want to use for your daily life, bank, uh, your bank account, healthcare provider, whatever. From time to time, the system will evolve because of modification in the regulation. Let's say, for instance, that uh, there is a change in an encryption policy and we want to increase uh, the quality of the encryption because more CPU power means that it's easier to break those systems. 
as we're intro introducing this tiny change from a software engineering perspective, we're just changing a configuration parameter in the cyber encryption policies that we are using. What happens actually is that we are triggering a cascade of modification on many other aspects of the system. Uh, first and foremost, we are changing the encryption policy. Therefore, we may increase uh, the CPU um, uh, usage of our system. And as we're increasing the CPU, it may take, it may take more time to receive um, some data. And so we're increasing the latency of the system. And because we're increasing the latency, we may ultimately affect or impact the temporal correctness of a system. And because we are changing the temporal correctness, we may create a new hazards. So of course, in the case of uh, your banking systems, what may happen is that you will wait longer or ultimately you may experience some time out. If the same situation happens when your aircraft has to receive, for instance, is um, its travel plan uh, from the air traffic control system, you may simply not receive the, the right data and get lost uh, in the Midwest. So of course, you may react that, okay, it's a software uh, issue. So not really a system issue. All of that can be um, under one perimeter, which is a software subsystem of my larger system. Actually, hey, Jerome, it's, yes. Jerome, so, sorry, are you, I, I forgot to ask. Some speakers like to take questions just at the end. Um, it seems like Sarah has a question. Um, are you interested in questions now? Um, whenever, feel free to shoot. Yeah, I, uh, think, this is, I think this is a really, really important slide. Um, I'm, I'm working with the NCOSI Working Group on Systems and Software Interface. And I think that this is really important because you, you title this sys software systems. But as you've mentioned, the system is not just software. Yeah, it it's, is. it's driven by software. Um, it's memory is software, it's brains are software, but just the very idea of, you know, you started with a uh, change of encryption, because it creates a new hazard for at least an aircraft, this could be um, inter affecting not only computer hardware, but lots of other kinds of hardware in not only aircraft, but it could be ground stations, it could be a lot of places that new hardware could be required. And so, I, I, I love this this chart. Thank you. It's actually all credits go, goes to uh, Peter Fader, uh, who made it with Bruce Lewis a while, a while back. But yeah, I, I fully agree with you. It is important. Especially, um, uh, I want to stress that uh, we have to, uh, and as you mentioned, Sarah, there is an important aspect behind that because with this story, um, a typical system engineer may say, oh, it is a software issue. It goes only in software, but as you mentioned, Sarah, it may have ripple effects uh, across the complete system process. And so, yes, it is important to think about the impact of what appears to be a minor modification at the software level across the, uh, the complete system. And indeed, if you take the perspective of cyber physical systems, which are systems made of mechanical electronics and software, as you mentioned, uh, Sarah, we may start with a bigger perspective on systems engineering. You will start with an hazard analysis, taking into account the fact that, yes, the operator may be in the loop. You will have some control engineers, people doing MATLAB, Simulink, uh, Laplace transform, et cetera, will try to control a system. Think about, for instance, a mechanical uh, system. Infusion pump has been um, one typical example for, uh, for such system. Even though we can, understand all those facets, it is important um, to, to remember that behind all of that, we have software. The control system is, has been designed by control engineers under some specific timing assumptions. Like for instance, every 20 milliseconds, I receive the right set of data. And you do expect that the data that you have received is no older than a couple of micro or milliseconds. Behind that, you have a runtime architecture that will ensure that you receive the correct information through a network of CPUs, multiple communication buses. So a, uh, the compute platform becomes um, a relevant artifact. So the hardware element is relevant. And of course, at the same time, the application software is there with all its complexity in terms of concurrency, in terms of communication, in terms of time support, in terms of uh, sampling uh, performance. And so 
We have to think uh, globally from system engineering to control engineering to hardware software uh, engineering. And mainly considerations related to safety, security, and performance have to be uh, abstracted away in such a way that we can address at the semantic level uh, those correct integration platform. And the last thing, the very last thing you want to do is to wait until you have the C code, ADA, C++, Java, whatever code to do those analyses because you will have waited way too long to look at those critical uh, issues. And for instance, in some cases, you may have to redesign completely your software to meet um, timing um, requirements. So of course, this is where we live today. This is the type of integration challenges that we want to address. So let me go back to um, systems engineering. What is interesting behind this uh, system thinking is that there, there exists a collection of standards in addition to system mindset really standards that will guide you into looking at specific elements. And ISO 15288 is one of those many standards that is defining processes as a set of inter interrelated or interacting activities which transform inputs into outputs. In ISO 15288, the objective is to organize, so to speak, the various processes as they are relating to the system life cycle. Enterprise processes, agreement processes, project and technical processes. Some, some of them may be outside of our scope because they are related much more to the strategy of the company you're uh, working with or subcontracting or project management. But if we want to address implementation, integration, or verification issues, we have to concentrate on technical processes. And many of them, as we will uh, develop in the next slides, relate or can make a strong usage of architectural models. If you can describe the architecture of your system, you can think about how elements can be integrated, what it means for two components to be interconnectable. Uh, of course, they need similar in interface. They need to exchange integers and to give the same semantics to those integers, if it is a temperature, a speed, or whatever. But behind that, there is the semantics of those interface. I will send you the temperature of this, um, of this um, maybe isolate every, every uh, second, and it will be in Fahrenheit. And the control software will check whether or not this is the expected value and trigger whatever safety mitigation uh, it can. Therefore, we have to think in terms of what type of models do we need uh, to support and to enhance those integration processes. And actually another, I suspect, a well-known um, uh, analysis of the V-cycle is this one, uh, again, that has been built um, by uh, former colleagues uh, coming from the SEI, uh, again, coming from the avionics community, which relates to uh, the cost uh, to remove errors in a system and the place where they are detected. Actually, what they realized coming, and again, this is in the avionics uh, domain, is that most of the requirements, um, or sorry, most of the errors uh, were found to be uh, in the requirements, the original uh, requirements. A very few of them actually could be removed, something like 3% uh, out of 70%. And the cost uh, to remove an error in a requirement is kind of easy. Basically, you just rework uh, this, um, this requirement. And as you are going down, basically, you are refining your system. And you are making potential mistakes because you have been misled by a faulty requirement. And as you are climbing on the right side, um, in many cases, you will um, eventually inject uh, new errors. But in many cases, you will detect them on the fly, for instance, during unit testing. But as you climb uh, in the, in this, um, on the right side of the V-cycle, actually almost 30% of, uh, of the errors are um, detected very late when you test the system, or even worse, when your customer is testing the system after its delivery. What we have to remember in this context is that the, the rework cost is a thousand uh, hundred, or if not a thousand times more costly than uh, the cost to fix one requirement. The reason for that is that you have to do root cause analysis. Why do I have a bug uh, or a misbehavior um, uh, when I'm doing the acceptance test? 
Well, well, it may be because uh, something is missing in the integration or something is missing in one of the um, low level uh, implementation of a function, or ultimately I have to go back uh, to the requirement. And as you unfold uh, this stack, uh, you may realize that, okay, one requirement was faulty, therefore I have to redevelop uh, all the impacted component. And again, you have to run test again, you have to run integration testing again, et cetera, et cetera. And this is not, um, I would say, scalable because as the software is becoming more and more um, pervasive in our system, every single issue in the software, be it um, a functional test failing, an integration test failing, will have a tremendous cost uh, on the global project. And what we are estimating is that the software as a percent of the total system cost went from something like 45% in 1997 to more than 85, if not 88% by 2024. And post-unit test software rework can account for a significant portion of the total system cost. Oops. Uh, and so we have to, um, to think about this uh, early um, risk reduction strategy. If we can actually uh, discover uh, errors or mistakes, I would say, basic mistakes uh, in the system at the architect architectural level definition, we can save a lot of money. And actually in the SCI digital library, you will find a couple of reports where basically some colleagues demonstrate that if you can allocate 10K uh, to um, correct your architecture, you can have a big payoff uh, ultimately um, at the end because you would save the project a couple of man months to rework the system ultimately, which means that you will reduce the budget and you will also reduce the time it takes to, um, to, exec to um, actually execute your, your system uh, project. And so to, to sum up what, we, uh, what, we, uh, what we're advocating for uh, through those elements is that definitely the software is increasingly dominating safety and mission critical system. First off, at the level of the functionalities, but also the cost to develop those systems. Many issues are discovered post unit test. And what we are advocating for is this early discovery of system level issues. And for that, as many colleagues before me at the SEI um, said, architecture is paramount. Architecture is paramount for uh, software engineering. It is paramount for system engineering. And because systems today are dominated by software, we have to find a way to combine the two uh, together. And so this approach uh, that my colleague Sam will um, introduce after is really what ADL is about, a standard to um, def describe and analyze your system. So for that, we have to, uh, to think in terms of MBSC, great, we need models and I I expect that uh, most of us in this room today agree that models can be um, useful for something. Now the question is, what do we expect in terms of model-based system or software engineering? What are the overarching objectives uh, if we can define them? Um, I don't want to create any, uh, any debate today, but really the idea is to, to try to look at them um, first and foremost, going from concept to code. The idea is, uh, at least for uh, so model-based software engineering, is to complement uh, typical software programming techniques, typical software engineering techniques with models. The objective is not to replace completely, but to address some of the shortcomings that we see as we have to manage uh, more complex projects. We need to organize stakeholder needs and collect requirements. We have to capture the system elements, their topology, what are the interfaces, the way they have to behave internally, and eventually um, how they will be combined together and built. And for that, we have to consider uh, software factories, uh, deployment capabilities, and eventually configuration and reconfiguration, uh, either offline or online. Ultimately, this software system must be uh, validated, must be assessed. And so we need to apply some analy analytical frameworks to assess that the model is fit for something, that it complies with some objectives. Syntax is, uh, of course, coming first, 
but also conformance to guidelines. If you're working for the medical domain or the avionics domain, there are some prescription on the way you should design your system. Design patterns is one aspect. Naming conventions, the type of technologies you are allowed to use are also a part of it. And also you want to evaluate um, system quality attributes with respect to performance, safety, security, behavior. From models, what you may expect, and I guess it's kind of familiar to many of you, is to synthesize portion of the software. You can do that from Simulink or SCADE models, but you can also do that from UML or AADL. And so, in my view, um, models is something like the new programming is sh should be um, an integral part of um, your uh, software engineering and system engineering journey. The reason for that is that you can get more insight than code only and document-based uh, solutions because you can have the relevant abstractions and automation. And here is one of the contentious issues that I would like to mitigate uh, with you today, which is that we have MBSC, model-based systems, and systems engineering. Many of you may be familiar with CCML. And so for the last 20, uh, 25 minutes, I discuss ADL. And you may wonder why uh, ADL and not CSML. The reason behind that is that if you look at the definition of MBSC, again, coming from the, uh, from the INCOSI, it is really about the formalized application of modeling to support systems engineering in general. And CSML is great for capturing relationships among system functions, requirements, et cetera. But it fails short for uh, many of the later development stages. We need other modeling notations for the hardware, the software. And actually with some colleagues uh, working in the uh, defense industry, we started to make uh, a map of the various elements that we need to build um, an avionics system. You need to capture the concept of operations, uh, system concepts and functions, subsystem architecture, uh, electronics, um, manufacturing, assembly, etc. For some of them, CSML will be a solution as an entry point to dispatch um, uh, various uh, activity to, activities to subgroups. And what ADL is addressing is actually two gaps that have been identified. One is uh, for defining the um, the architecture of the cyber physical uh, subsystem, if you will, hardware, software, and interaction with some uh, abstract system functions. And the later for, um, for uh, integration and field testing. The idea is that through virtual integration, you can early on perform some analysis uh, for your system. And so with that uh, landscape uh, being set, what uh, ADL is about really is this idea of combining physical software and computer systems or platform across one notation that is being that has been standardized by SA International and tested uh, across multiple projects. Um, actually, ADL started as um, as a standard in 1999, so long before UML and CSML. Um, went into uh, this MBSC uh, concept. The idea was really to support the avionics community to reason uh, on their own system. And so for that, now I will leave uh, the floor to my colleague, Sam Proctor, to provide uh, an overview of, um, of AADL uh, from a more, I would say, language-centric perspective. So Sam, you should be Hi. able, yeah, you're right. Yeah, can you, uh, everybody hear me okay? You're good. All right, great. Um, so yeah, let's take a, a little bit of a deeper dive into AADL itself. And I guess as you're watching this, if if you know you're intrigued by AADL, we'll talk about ways to get a hold of it, ways to get a hold of the tooling. If AADL is not something you're ready to dive into right away, that's okay. What we'll, in addition to AADL, we'll be talking about sort of the reason behind certain choices that we've made and the the benefits of the approach. And I imagine that with careful technology selection and, and I, uh, sort of knowing uh, some of the possibilities out there, uh, you might be able to make uh, better or at least uh, sort of safer, less risky uh, sort of decisions in, in future technology 
selections. So when we talk about AADL, uh, we're actually talking about a, a full standard of, uh, or a full suite of standards. We talk about core AADL, and this is the main AADL uh, language that really focuses on embedded uh, software systems, embedded software-based or software-driven systems, and supports the generation of a, a number of different types of evidence through uh, different system analyses. So you can do performance analyses that come up with things like the worst case response time along various flows through your system. So you might say, you know, given a sensor change here, how long does it take the actuator to actuate? Um, we can uh, look at the schedulability of a collection of threads on a process or processes on uh, physical processors. Um, there are a number of safety analyses uh, and uh, some of the, the model review and code generation that you see on the left. Some of these more advanced analyses uh, rely on AADL uh, specifications beyond core AADL and get into these uh, what we call AADL annexes. So these build on top of and require the core AADL, but then extend that with additional properties and component types uh, for things like modeling errors, which lets you analyze safety or reliability uh, or security, or even um, platform or uh, domain specific uh, annexes like ARINC 653 or the, the FACE annex. So uh, we, we find a lot of benefit with core AADL, but we also find that um, building on top of that with these annexes really lets you uh, describe uh, a number of architectural and architecture adjacent aspects of your system. So at this point, we've talked about AADL quite a bit. Um, I am technical enough that I'm uncomfortable going much further without uh, showing you a little bit of AADL itself. So we have a number of ways to um, teach AADL. There's a, a course that we can deliver in person or online. There are textbooks. Uh, but now what we're going to do is the world's shortest overview uh, of AADL itself. So AADL has both a graphical and a textual syntax. And we'll be using the graphical one primarily today. And like the sort of diagrams that engineers draw on whiteboards, it, the graphical syntax is fundamentally a box and line style uh, diagramming language. The difference between the diagrams drawn in AADL's graphical syntax and those drawn by engineers is in the precision and the permanence of the semantics. Uh, so if I were to draw a box and line diagram, I might say to whoever is listening, you know, this represents a component, this over here is another component, and this line between them is a network connection. But as soon as we leave that room, that definition is lost, except what we remember about it. And even if we wrote down word for word what I said, the definition is in English, which is famous for its ambiguities. Uh, so AADL has the semantics of things like uh, a process, in this case, uh, defined in its standard. So what we're gonna build over the next just couple of slides is a small portion of a smart building. We have a, a temperature control process that is gonna monitor the temperature in some room and then adjust a fan uh, when that temperature gets outside of some set boundary. So we've given ourselves a process to work in a protected region of memory uh, and we can allocate individual threads, which are themselves just a, a different type of box, a dashed line here instead of uh, a solid line. But once again, there are very precise meanings. So we can feed these threads into some of those analyses that let us talk about whether or not they'll be schedulable, let us talk about the end-to-end -end latency uh, for different things. Uh, as soon as we connect them together. So here are those uh, connections. In this case, because our lines are between threads, we know that they represent in, uh, intra-process communication. The uh, head and tail of these lines is significant, uh, whether we're sending just events, just notifications that something has changed, like the temperature here, or whether we're actually sending some sort of data payload. And so the, the modeling notation is, is grokkable. You can look at it and sort of see uh, the flow through the system, but it is also uh, very deep. It has uh, these uh, the, the rich and well-specified semantics. And then we can add additional semantics through AADL's property mechanism. And there are a number of properties that come with the core language. There are a number of properties that come with uh, basically every language annex, but the AADL properties are also designed to be user extensible. So you can add domain or even system specific properties that are meaningful uh, only to you or only to your organization and use those uh, as sort of integrated in a way with the rest of your models. So we might, in this case, want to attach things like the dispatch semantics. We might want our, our thermostat or our thermometer to wake up 
periodically, every minute, every 30 seconds, what have you, to check the temperature of the room. And so periodic dispatch makes sense there. But for our software controller or even our fan, periodic dispatch doesn't make any sense. We don't want our fan turning on and off according to some clock. We want it turning on and off according to the temperature in the room. And so we would have a, a sporadic dispatch for that. And so this is uh, not intended to be a, a deep dive into AADL, but hopefully this gives you sort of a feel of if you build an AADL model, what are the types of activities that you're going to be doing? Of course, in real AADL, you have a lot more than just processes and threads. In fact, you have a full collection of application components, uh, the process and the thread that we just looked at, but you can also group those threads. Um, we see a lot of use of uh, data and data modeling, um, even subprograms, which is about the lowest level of abstraction uh, that AADL typically gets, at least before those annexes get involved. Uh, and then everything can be collected together in one or more systems. We also uh, support the specification of the execution platform itself um, and device components, which are essentially black boxes. So if your system has to interact with some uh, element or other system and you don't want to break it down into processes and threads, you can use a device. But specifying things like the processor, whether that's a virtual or a physical processor, the bus and the memory, lets you do things uh, like examine the budgets for your system. Do you have enough computational resources, enough processing power, enough memory, uh, enough bandwidth on your buses? And so in addition to, to analyzing data flow type elements, you can you can analyze these more budgetary concerns uh, that also can cause a lot of problems in system development. So what does AADL look like in the real world? Well, it is it, is, it, it looks very close to the, the diagrammatic view that I gave you earlier. This is a screenshot of an actual AADL system. Again, we see these components in these lines. We see the uh, different and, and significant, but still sort of easily understandable uh, heads and tails of those arrows that have uh, specific meanings that we don't have time to dive into today, um, but, but carry uh, a great deal of meaning that is part of those standards. And then I mentioned that there's also a textual syntax. Which one you use depends a little bit on your comfort and your background. We find that systems engineers typically prefer the graphical uh, syntax, at least until you get into sort of the weeds when you have to specify properties. Um, but if you have a computer science background, you may be more comfortable with the, the textual syntax. The choice there doesn't really matter. You can convert between the two. You can write in text, generate graphics, update that, and then uh, sync that back to the text. And then like I mentioned earlier, um, if you want to extend any of the functionality into things like errors or behavior, uh, there are annexes for that. So how does all this plug together? Well, here's a, a really basic uh, producer-consumer example. And I guess I want you to sort of look at this uh, as a series of layers. And these layers can be thought of as different aspects of a single model or uh, as different steps in creating a model and, and, and specifying your system. So your processor here, your processor or your producer, um, thread, uh, has some execution time with it, maybe some data element, and then a, a consumer over here. And so already with just this layer of the model, we can do uh, analyses that depend on the data flow through the system. So this is things like a latency analysis or a security analysis. Should this thread be able to access this data? Should it be able to send it to this other thread? Do we have the correct sort of security controls in place? Then we can uh, specify some of those execution platform components, the memory or the processor that will actually be executing and storing uh, the data as it moves through the system. And now we can run some of those budgetary analyses. Do we have enough memory? Do, does this uh, ethernet bus down here have enough bandwidth for our producer to send all the information that it needs to to the consumer? And so this, uh, this multiple levels of abstraction and this sort of slicing of the model is really designed to support uh, different levels of abstraction, not only for different analyses, but also so that when you uh, are trying to read about a system, when you're trying to learn about a system, whether you're an engineer that's just been brought onto the project or some sort of certification authority who has been tasked with understanding the system and certifying its appropriateness for some type of use, um, this really lets you control the amount of information that you can start to understand the system before you understand the entire system. And, and this is one of the real benefits of any modeling-based approach, whether it's uh, AADL or, or SysML or, or anything else. So uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit and talk about AADL's uh, capabilities and tooling real quick. And we see that uh, we've seen 
we've seen quite a few statements about the capabilities of AADL in the real world. These come from academia, where AADL is well cited in a number of publications. We see it in uh, industrial, commercial, and military projects, where AADL has been used in a number of different ways. One of the most exciting ways is what we call uh, AADL as a backbone. This is where um, AADL is used sort of uh, as one element in a large uh, set of modeling technologies and techniques, like that slide that Jerome showed you earlier with all the different modeling approaches, all the different modeling tools. AADL, with its unambiguous statement, uh, statements about a, a system's architecture can really be used to tie together, to weave together a, a number of modeling approaches. And then there are a number of analysis capabilities that either operate directly on AADL um, or uh, integrate with AADL. And again, we won't go through all of these. Um, some that are near and dear to my heart as a safety researcher are your fault analyses capabilities built into uh, OSATE uh, and some of the other tools. Um, and then uh, we'll talk about some, some cool research capabilities uh, that check some of these boxes as well, things like scheduling or, or model checking, or even some that aren't on here, like uh, AADL's integration and support for um, model-based DevOps. There are a number of tool chains. Uh, OSATE, the open source architecture tool environment, is one that we develop here at the Software Engineering Institute. We see a lot of uh, research uh, from the model-based engineering world implemented directly as plugins into OSATE. This is how it worked for me when I was in grad school. This is how it worked for a lot of Jerome students um, uh, in his university days. But then there are commercial tools like KMA, which builds on top of OSATE, or sort of completely independent uh, of OSATE, like the the more uh, commercial tools from ANSYS and, uh, and Eldis. So I think uh, we're running a little bit behind, so I'm not gonna go much deeper on this, but just know <laughs> that these, these slides will be available and I think we can get these links to people if, if you're interested in this sort of stuff. <laughs> Um, as far as transitioning AADL, uh, one of our big transition partners as a DOD uh, federally funded research and development center is the U.S. Army, who is developing uh, a number of systems as part of their future vertical lift family of programs. These are uh, developing successors to uh, what we would typically call or what I would have called before being familiar with this program, uh, helicopters. And they are applying AADL and the architecture-centric virtual integration process, the process by which we recommend using AADL in major system development and acquisition to this future vertical lift challenge. And Alex Boydston, who uh, works with the U.S. Army, has identified a number of benefits of AADL and ACFIP. And we've talked about a lot of these already, things like finding problems early and, and reducing risk, but also things that we aren't going to focus on a lot today, but are, are intuitive, things like the increased cybersecurity that comes from having a, a well-specified model of your system where you can check individual flows between uh, different components and verify that they that they meet your security policy. And it really all comes down to this virtual integration that uh, Jerome mentioned uh, earlier, where you specify your software, you specify your hardware, you can virtually integrate it before you actually build um, any of your system. There are a number of smaller projects uh, where AADL has been used uh, and we've had a number of benefits. One that I really wanna highlight is this DARPA Hackums project here in the middle. The idea behind DARPA Hackums was pretty neat. Uh, a number of uh, academics and more research focused people in uh, industry have been talking for years about building unhackable systems with a secure by design approach. And so DARPA went to these uh, experts and said, okay, we're gonna use all your techniques and we're gonna see if it works. We're gonna build an unmanned helicopter. And then we're going to give the specifications, the source code, the AADL models uh, that you use to a, a red team who will try and take control of the unmanned uh, vehicle and given a huge amount of time, something like six weeks, and they were unsuccessful. The secure by design approach succeeded. AADL was uh, just sort of one uh, star in the constellation of techniques and tools that was used here. This is one of those projects that used this AADL as, as a backbone approach, where AADL provided a, a rigorous architecture specification, and then more specialized uh, modeling languages and tools were used to uh, specify different bits of the overall system. But the ultimate result was, was like I said, very successful. Uh, the unmanned vehicle was not able to be uh, compromised in a way that we see uh, is unfortunately common um, uh, with more traditionally uh, engineered systems. So 
But now we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about research. Uh, and I just, we're going to focus on a couple of research projects when I hand it back to Jerome and Dio here in a second. But there are a number of lines of research in systems and, and model-based systems engineering that have used AADL that have been built on top of AADL. Uh, some of these are, are you know, well-established uh, problems and uh, with pretty clear solutions like virtual integration. Some are very new, like the, the increasing focus on autonomy has, uh, of course, I think affected uh, basically everything uh, in the systems engineering world. And so we're starting to see uh, autonomy research show up in uh, AADL and, and the model-based systems engineering work that we do here as well. So uh, I guess bear in mind that what you're about to see is just sort of a, a snapshot of a few small programs, but that there's a lot of cool research going on uh, using uh, AADL. And with that, I think it's back to you, Jerome. Yeah, thank you, Sam. So, yeah. So, um... We just um, go back to two uh, research topics. So as you may imagine, the, um, the idea behind AADL is, is quite ambitious, but be, um, behind AADL is not just a language that we're trying to promote, but really the idea is that uh, with models, we can improve um, analysis capabilities. So <clears throat> we did that for performance, safety, security, et cetera. And, uh, furthermore, there are two aspects that we want to highlight uh, before jumping to the final QA, uh, Q and A, which is one related to what we call mod DevOps, and the other one related to uh, contract-based analysis. Um, so, as, as you may know, I mean um, the ACI is promoting a lot what they call DevSecOps, uh, which is based on DevOps, which is the idea of building um, a software pipeline from uh, software. Uh, concerns down to the um, to the actual binaries that you will deploy and execute. You will collect metric and go back to um, to your workbench to eventually improve your system. So behind this infinity loop, there is this idea to deliver software faster with increased quality because you have this idea of continuous integration, continuous deployment, containerization, so that ultimately you can control your system. And so what we what we did as part of this work around MBSC was to say, well, why don't we create mod DevOps, which is something like a system software engineering culture with the idea to improve um, uh, the system engineering capabilities by unifying system engineering software development and software operation. System engineering based on model, typical software engineering based on programming languages and software operation be, built on top of a typical um, software factory pipeline. The main objective uh, behind this idea of mod DevOps is to strongly advocate for abstraction, automation, and monitoring. And so what do we mean by that? Well, basically you want to build um, through your modeling process, a collection of models, CSML, controller built on top of uh, Simulink, ADL, uh, integrating this controller with a complete hardware software platform, SIP um, that will implement um, the control of your system so that by combining those elements, A, D, L, and C, you can eventually deploy um, uh, the model on your system. And again, you can build this first pipeline. And behind this idea of mod DevOps, what we are advocating for is for an, a way to be um, imaginative, to explore a new way to combine models, to deliver your system. As we are seeing more and more automation uh, between CSML and ADL with a gateway uh, made by Adventium, code generation capabilities from ADL to C, code generation capabilities from Simulink to C, we can see a way where we can remove um, the big gap uh, between programming uh, and system engineering. We can view system engineering process as a continuum of models at various levels of abstractions with different type of objectives so that ultimately you can be uh, agile and go as fast as possible to build and deploy your actual system. And so behind this idea of mod DevOps, which is a, pro a project that we completed in 2020, there is this idea of combining the best of MBSC and uh, DevOps approach. And similarly, I will just jump two slides and leave the floor to Dio to conclude. Uh, there is this idea of contract um, behind that uh, so that we can help designer to transition towards MBSC. And yep. Uh, mm. All right. No, uh, wait, wait, wait. I'm a little bit confused with my mouse. So, uh, Sam, can you do uh, disconnect yours, please? Yep, here you go. 
the issue yeah you have the control all right yeah thank you yes so by now you already got the image that when we mean the models we mean analysis of models we, mm -hmm. we mean models to be analyzed right so this follows also the philosophy of the digital engineering mindset to say we should model first analyze and then build right so so with this mindset uh, and uh, all this integration of multiple analysis, one of the challenges we have is that uh, in general, people will use this analysis as a black box. Actually, at the very beginning, Phil was alluding to this situation where you do not know the low level details of the analysis. And if everything works fine, then that's the ideal situation. You will get an answer and find out whether some property, for instance, latency, uh, kind of uh, has the, the number you're looking for, right? The property you're looking for. Unfortunately, all of these analysis make a lot of assumptions. And if the assumptions are wrong, then one of the problems you will have is that uh, you may then get into a situation where you get the, the wrong answer, say the analysis didn't work. And now you need to understand why when, uh, things went wrong. And that means you need to get into the details <clears throat> of the, this analysis. And that's actually a big barrier for adoption. So this particular uh, project actually focuses on how do we build these contracts around this way. I think once we clear that, uh, maybe this can, hurdle will be. Can you? We have a hot mic. Can we? Yes. Mic's hot. That is on the on the technical side. On the technical side. Okay. <laughs> so the idea here is to create a description of these assumptions and that description actually can be automatically verified. So if we get into this situation, we will find a way to verify the assumptions, find out ways to correct these assumptions uh, in order to really uh, get the benefit of this high level analysis, right? And as uh, we have mentioned before, the this, this is a plethora of analysis that we have and there will be interactions across the assumptions of these multiple analyses and how one fit the, uh, one another. For instance, talking about the schedulability and resource utilization, it kind of make, uh, for instance, that makes the assumption of a particular frequency at which the processor is running. And that frequency actually talks about the voltage that it's using, which also leads to the thermal dissipation and all of these are multiple connections to different analyses that will need to be a kind of reason about and verify that all the assumptions are actually a, can be fully satisfied. They do not contradict each other. So this is the core or the target of our uh, uh, of this particular project. And of course, we will not get uh, be able to get to the to the details but the, at least the, it will give you an intuition of the complexity and the power that ADL brings into the picture, putting all these analyses together, checking the consistency of the application of these multiple analyses in the same uh, venue, right? Uh, very briefly, this is just, we build an argumentation. If you have seen assurance cases, you will recognize a pattern of how we break into a tree these different arguments that relates, uh, in this case, on assumptions that can be verified by any uh, other context analysis and the like, right? In the end, we want to go, as uh, Jerome was mentioning at the beginning, we want to start very early on analyzing models with partial information. We want to enable that. But as we do the refinement go all the way down to implementation, we want to keep track of the different assumptions we make and how to verify these assumptions going all the way down to the implementation where the last set of assumptions need to be checked. Because of course, we need to verify that the model matches the implementation. That is one of the thresholds that actually are very tricky to handle. And people sometimes just give up models because the implementation is completely different. This is something that actually we are targeting here. And we will just jump into the conclusions, opening up the floor for additional questions. But very quickly, one of the things we want to uh, kind of wanted to communicate here is that really model-based engineering and model-based systems engineering is kind of the key to build large complex systems, right? In particular, DOT systems. 
we know and we have experienced that there are no silver bullets. Every now, now and then, there's a silver bullet that comes into the community. The reality is there are no silver bullets. And we need to kind of bring together multiple disciplines, multiple languages, multiple modeling techniques to really solve the problem, right? Uh, the other thing that to note is that ADL, as we mentioned, is kind of at the center of a collection, large collection of analysis. ADL have a strong focus on what the software means for the system. And all the analysis that are around that actually uh, kind of supports this quest, if you will. Finally, we just need to point out that there are plenty of technical reports and, and videos that you can access in our SEI digital library. We will be very happy if you can take advantage of this resource. And with this, I think we'll open these two questions. So please. Yes, yeah, so I'll have people raise their hand, but Paul has put a question thread into the chat. So I'll read it out for you guys. Um, he's, he's got a theme of, you know, what is the investment up front kind of to use this? And so what are the training requirements for an organization using AADL? What percentage of the team would need to know or understand the graphical or text syntax? How many hours of training is required for an individual to uh, get to the level to synthesize a model? Um, how many hours of training is required for someone to be able to review or evaluate it? And what size products or projects would you think where there's like a cost benefit to creating these models? So there's a lot to digest there. That's a lot of questions in one. So uh, I can provide two perspectives, uh, one based on my uh, experience as a professor, which is that um, for engineers who are well-trained in embedded systems in general, or uh, uh, trained in systems engineering, um, so if they know a little bit already of CSML or Simulink, uh, learning ADL will be an initial investment of something like 20, 25 hours. Uh, the SEI has an online class uh, that is, I guess, in the 30 or 40 hours. I guess 40 hours is an upper bound uh, for it, where you will go from zero to being able of, uh, to build your own model. So um, again, the investment is, um, reasonable in that ADL builds on, builds on top of, I will say, typical embedded system uh, ontology. You will build your system based on this idea of thread, connection, and ports, which is kind of um, the bar is lower than learning, for instance, CSML, where you will have to understand a lot more in terms of context and concepts. It's not, not uh, a, I mean, I don't want to confront them. As I said, CSML is Fit, uh, fit for one set of project activities, ADL for the other set. After that, there is a question of modeling for analysis. And here I will say uh, it's, it really depends on uh, your initial question. Why do you want to do a model? Don't never ever do a model just to cross a checkbox uh, for your customer. That does not work this way. You model because you are looking to assess something uh, that will benefit for your uh, project. And for that, it really depends on the type of properties you want to evaluate. There exist many, many tools uh, for uh, assessing very particular properties. And I would say it really depends on the level of precision. In my class, for instance, or uh, the SEI class, you will do it basic safety analysis or basic scheduling analysis. And this fits a budget of 40 hours for teaching. If you want to, uh, to build the next, uh, the next launcher for, uh, for NASA, well, you will need a couple of months to, to be precise about the analysis that you want to execute. But this is unrelated to the, um, to the modeling language itself. It is you as an engineer who has to understand the type of elements that you must collect, engineering data, um, the architecture of the system that will support the claim you want to build. And ultimately, ADL will be just there to aggregate all those data into one model and someone else will build the corresponding analysis capability. So it's very difficult to answer the, the second question because it really depends on the analysis that you want to, uh, to execute. And what Dio mentioned with Atmac and what other like Kame did uh, for Adventium is really this idea to package analysis so that as you are modeling for one particular objective, you receive the proper guidance to build the model accordingly. So it's not an easy answer, but 
is the one I can make. Does it clarify? I yep. think so, Paul. Paul, you had some a follow up. You can you can throw that out there verbally, uh, okay. if you'd like. So, could you you mentioned several prerequisites, which of course recent grad recent bachelor grads would have. Um, mid career people might not have. Could you relist those? I think it, I think well, Simulink was one of them, but I don't remember the other two. Oh. Uh, um... It's, uh, it's um, I was just giving the typical profile uh, for my students. Uh, so what we expect is uh, someone with, uh, who has a college degree, uh, who is familiar with embedded systems or systems engineering. And if you have a, a, an early exposure to modeling like Simulink or CSML, um, you can go directly and attend one of our, of one of our class. Um, because that's the typical profile of students we see. And the feedback we received was, was really positive in that um, people could um, apply AADL uh, to their own need. Thank you. Okay, does anyone else have a question and want to raise their hand? If, if not, then I'll go to the, I, I grabbed a couple questions off the board uh, earlier. Just okay, so can we get the slides? Um, yeah, they the DO said that they would send the slides out. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Sure. Okay, yeah, so oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, uh, uh, as I said, yeah, we, we'll work with Phil to, to have the slides uh, published on the SCI website or in the uh, chapter website. Yes. Thanks, thanks, Jerome. Okay, so one of the questions, um, I, I don't have, I, I just grab, grab these out. But somebody was asking, could you guys describe a real use case of MBSE um, as a development and decision maker tool? Uh, yes, I can describe uh, one uh, in Europe, uh, if you will, uh, that, that used AADL actually. Um, at that time, I was working with the European Space Agency, and uh, so we developed some uh, MBSE workflow uh, based on AADL. That has been applied on um, on a system that was collecting energy from the sun. Uh, just imagine a big parabola that would just collect uh, the heat from the sun and turn that into energy. And all of that uh, required some uh, control systems and uh, because you have to track the trajectory of the sun. And all of that was built uh, using uh, AADL and cogeneration techniques and uh, scheduling analysis. And yeah, I, I will add a note on, on that on the slides, uh, Phil, if you will. Okay, great. Thanks, thanks, Jerome. Okay, then the second question, I don't see any hands raised. Um, any advice on how to build system models, you know, kind of how to get started uh, based on requirements and use cases? Yeah, I think the, the key here is what Jerome was mentioning a little bit in response to the first set of questions, which is modeling to a particular analysis that you never sort of build a model because you you want to check a box or because you want to model. So I guess if there is if you have a collection of requirements or a collection of use cases, I would start with the low hanging fruit. So look at one requirement or a family of requirements or or one use case or a family there and say you know it, this aligns particularly well with. Um, uh, an analysis that comes out of the box with AADL. So if you have a requirement like the end the end, end latency from your sensor to your actuator shall be some amount of time. Building that, uh, which only requires the data flow aspects of AADL, um, means that you don't have to use the full set of features in AADL. You can build uh, a, a partial model, just enough to support the analysis. And then you have uh, the ability to verify that that requirement is met. And then you look at a second requirement or a second use case and, you know, find one if you can that sort of reuses much of what you've built. And then you you extend your model, hopefully slightly, only slightly, 
to support this second analysis. And then you can rerun the first analysis to make sure that your changes haven't invalidated any of your results, but you can build on it in that sort of iterative way by, by focusing on an easy to check requirement first and then sort of extending it one at a time. Um, is that, I don't know, Jerome or Dio, if you wanna add anything to that. But. You know, that, that's really the idea, which is that modeling has to serve a purpose. And if you start with requirements and if your requirements are smart, which is simple, uh, modular, um, and ultimately testable, basically you will build, as Sam mentioned, a model that will test whether or not your requirement is valid. And that should be your driver. Great, and then here's another one. Um, so we know in brownfield settings, you know, a lot of times when you have a legacy system or something's already deployed and you wanna make changes to that, you might wanna take advantage of MBSE. What are some of the challenges you see and do you have any success stories uh, related related to, to Brownfield? Uh, if you allow me to go back, uh, tuk, tuk, tuk. Uh, actually one of the, uh, I mean, some mentioned one out of the three uh, um, projects that we did with the US Army. And actually the first one uh, on the Chinook was about exactly this uh, scenario um, without going to, um, into too much detail, uh, they wanted to change the CPU architecture because yeah, CPU evo are evolving. And uh, by applying AADL, uh, the team at that time could evaluate uh, potential integration risks in terms of uh, bandwidth and CPU usage that will lead to, uh, to uh, some project uh, issues. And so, yeah, it, it has been applied um, on this particular project, yes. Great, thanks, thanks, Jerome. Um, I have one last question. This one is actually from from me. Um, so some work I'm doing with the Air Force, you know, there's challenges, and I can't really go into the details. But one of the things that's going on is many organizations are working, and they're modeling, and they're all creating and capturing properties, important properties that go into these these models. You know, think about like a a, a network router and what its capacity is, and you know what you know, for commercial transport, what the bandwidth is that we would have at, at a given time, what's the probability we'll have bandwidth that we need uh, for certain things. And what's going on is in each model, you know, some people have real instrumented data out there from real observations and instrumentation they've done. And that's really good. And so you get good results from the models there. Sometimes you get really poor results because people are just kind of guessing or, you know, estimating. And so, do you have you done any work like in standardization of capturing these properties in ways where you can import them from one tool to another? Is that part of your research agenda? I guess that's kind of something I'm interested in, and I think maybe some of the audience might be as well. I I don't know uh, about work with that specifically. I'll say that there is a really closely analogous problem um, in assurance uh, where you are looking at safety or essentially claims that some evidence you know, establishes some claim. And that evidence comes in different strengths, right? Like sometimes you have very direct uh, evidence that refutes some claim and sometimes you don't. And so there are assurance and evidentiary models that sort of incorporate that. And so we've seen that pulled in uh, with AADL, I think Brian Larson, who is on the call, has uh, looked at this with some uh, some assurance case work um, in like a Northstar tool, if I remember correctly. But um, that that is something that comes from the the safety and the assurance world, uh, where you have to sort of gauge confidence in something. I think beyond that, and applying that directly to to system requirements and. Um, and outside of the assurance world, which naturally comes with a lot of this confidence machinery, I, I am not familiar. I don't know, Jerome or Dio, if you are. Well, uh, there has been a lot, well, there is a, a set of configuration parameters, for instance, for scheduling, and there has been an attempt to do the same for network, but we, we lacked resources for that. Another aspect that we miss uh, is uh, a standard way for uh, describing Avionics platform. Uh, it's probably better to discuss that offline because there's a collection of standards uh, in the in the work by Aring and um, the SAE for that, but that's kind of unrelated to MBSC. Basically, it is how you can um, 
build uh, your configuration data in a way that is compatible with configuration management and how you can collect um, and configure a test bench or any network uh, so that you can collect data. But it's it, it's a, it's a large field because any industry basically as as we as they see the benefit of models, they see the need for more interconnection. Um, the models as we have presented them today are mostly design models from which you can uh, generate analysis model. But then you want also to to compare your design model with any testing data that you may collect. And this is, as far as I know, an open problem. I know that the automotive industry is addressing partially this issue with the FMI standard, uh, mostly in Germany, but that's, that's a complete uh, open field of research, I would say at this stage, but definitely a critical one to, to uh, go further into uh, automating those processes. Okay, th thank you. Um... I guess, is there anything else we have a few minutes left? If anybody has a last minute question, um, I'll give it a little bit of a pause. If there's not, uh, we'll stop the talk and um, I'll thank these gentlemen and send them on their way. Is there any questions or comments? Uh, just, just, just a comment. This is Brian Larson. I put a link in the chat to a project that Sam mentioned that has an AADL model that also has a, an assurance case using the Northstar tool and some requirements using the FAA's Requirements Engineering Management Handbook. Okay, th thank you, Brian. We, we appreciate that. Okay, I don't see anybody's hand up. So I would like to thank everyone for taking time out of their day. I know everybody's busy and probably scarfing down not their preferred lunch at their desk and joining us. It's really nice of you all. Um, and thank you, Jerome, Sam, and Dio. Um, you know, really appreciate you guys giving giving the time to us today. Um, and, you know, hope to see you at some, you know, point in the future, um, you know, in the office, obviously, and, you know, also um, maybe in another talk at some, some point if we continue these. Um, and Jack, do you want to wrap up or you have anything to say? No, just thank you to everyone and, yeah, uh, for the presenters and the attendees. Okay, enjoy your afternoon, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, goodbye.